Math 1332, Chapter 2, Set Theory, Section 2.2, .2, Subsets and Set Operations, Video 1, Universal Set, Complement of a Set. In the previous series of videos, we talked about the idea of a set being a collection of objects. We talked about the objects within a set being called elements, and we were introduced to a couple of symbols, which I'll draw briefly just to remind you what they look like. We were introduced to the symbol that looks like this, which is the symbol for is an element of. And we looked and we were introduced this, to that symbol, which is the symbol for is not an element of. Both of those express the relationship between an object and a collection of objects. This one says an object belongs to a collection of objects. And this one says an object does not belong to a collection of objects. We also talked about three different ways to represent sets using the roster method, the descriptive method, and set builder notation. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that we talked about in that section. Oh yes, we also talked about the empty set, the set that contains no elements. We talked about the cardinality of a set, which is the same as the number of elements in a set. We talked about finite and infinite sets. We also talked about equal and equivalent sets. And there was one more thing that I wanted to say. We also talked about some special sets of numbers, the natural numbers, the whole numbers, the integers, the rational numbers, and the real numbers. In this series of videos, we're going to be talking about set operations and subsets. But before we can talk about both of those, we need to introduce a couple of pretty simple concepts. The first of which is called the universal set. As you see, I've already got the definition of the universal set here, but let's just take a look at it. For a given situation, the universal set denoted as capital U is the set of all objects reasonable to consider for that situation. So it's a fairly open-ended definition. Uh, loosely speaking, in a given context, the universal set is everything that would exist within that context. Uh, let's take a look at a few examples where the universal set is waiting to be uh, determined. For example A, we want to consider the number of times people have visited a bank. So let's say that you're surveying people and you ask them, how many times have you visited this bank? Just give us your guess, your best guess. What type of answers would you get? 10, 20, once, zero? Are there any types of answers we wouldn't get? Oh, I don't think we'd get an answer of negative two or 1.7 or something like that. So what do you notice about all the possible answers that we could be given? For the most part, they're natural numbers, but you gotta be careful because there is one answer you could give that is not a natural number and that is zero. So if we wanted to talk about reasonable answers to this question, how many times is it, have you visited a bank? There's a couple of ways that we could represent what would be a good universal set. We could use the roster method by saying, maybe they'll say zero, maybe they'll say one or two or three or four, dot, dot, dot. Or we could just say the whole numbers, which we had reserved the capital letter W for. What would be wrong with saying the natural numbers? What is the, why is this set of numbers, which is about to be highlighted, not the natural numbers? It's almost the natural numbers, except the natural numbers does not include the number zero. If zero was not a possible answer, then this would be a more reasonable universe. But since zero could be an answer to the question, how many times have you visited a bank? Then we need to include zero in our universe, which means that our universe is probably best represented by the whole numbers. Could we say a larger set like the integers, which includes all of the whole numbers and their negatives? Well, it wouldn't be wrong because that universal set would contain all the possible answers, but it would also contain a lot of numbers that couldn't possibly be answers. So when you're asked what's a reasonable universe, you really wanna get the smallest possible universe that would contain everything that could belong uh, in that particular situation. Uh, let's take a look at B. We want to consider the make of vehicle a person drives. So again, pretend that you're asking people a question. Uh, you see people driving down the street. I guess you could determine the answer to the question. Okay, let's say you see people driving down the street and you make note of the make of vehicle that they drive. So like a Ford or a Nissan or something like that. 
what would be a good reasonable universal set? What would be all the possible answers? Well, unlike the previous example, I don't think it's very reasonable to try to list all the possible answers. In other words, I don't think it's very reasonable to try to describe, uh, to try to write this universal set using the roster method. Maybe it would be better if we used a descriptive method. So what would be a good way to describe it, the universal set in this situation? We could say all possible makes of vehicles. And that would be perfectly acceptable to describe the universal set. If we're gonna ask you what make of vehicle do you drive, then our universal set will be all the possible answers that I could get, which are all possible makes of vehicles. So sometimes you just describe the universal set. Uh, speaking of which, let's take a look at example C. We want to consider the words people choose to write a paragraph. And we can be more specific, such as uh, we could say something like the words in the opening sentence of, of novels. So you pick a novel, you open it up to the first sentence, and you write down every word. What would be a good reasonable universal set? There's a couple of ways to describe this, but I would, what, what I would not do is use the roster method and try to list out every possible word somebody could use. But what contains all the possible words somebody could use? And we're assuming English, but this could easily translate to other languages as well. Is there a convenient place that contains all words that you might use? The answer is yes. That convenient place is known as the dictionary. Actually, we should probably say something besides that, because if I say the set that contains the dictionary, it contains one object, a dictionary. So what we really mean is all words in the dictionary, which are the things people would use to write paragraphs. Uh, you won't be determining a lot of universal sets. It's actually more important that you understand that they exist within a given context, especially when we define our next term, the complement of a set. So just keep in mind that the universal set is for a given situation denoted as a capital U. It's the set of all objects reasonable to consider for that situation. All right, let's talk about complement of a set. Now, before I go to the next page and, and unveil, unveil the definition of complement, I want you to think about what it means for things to be complementary. Now, I don't mean complement with an I, I mean complement with an E. If you spell complement with an I, and I'll just quickly draw an I over where it would be in a different spelling, over that E. If you spell complement with an I, that's when you say something nice to somebody. You look nice today. You did well on your test. Uh, your hair looks good or something like that. But when spelled with an E, the word complement means two things that go together, uh, such as peanut butter and jelly or night and day, they complement each other. Um, or left shoe, right shoe, something like that. But what is a complement of a set? Well, in order to define a complement, we have to assume that our set resides in some, inside some, of, some universal set. So let's just throw an example out there and then we'll look at the next page. Let's say our universal set is the set of all people currently living on earth. And we have one set that is the set of all males currently living on Earth, whatever you define as male, going with the biological definition here. What do you think the complement of that set is? What do you think the complement of the set of all males is? If you said the set of all females and assuming a binary gender for the sake of simplicity in this discussion, then you would be correct. But if you said something more generic as the set of all people who are not males, then you would also be correct. So let's get to the definition of a complement. Suppose the set A contains elements that belong to some universal set. So we've got some universal set and we build a set by taking elements from that universal set and saying, look, I got a set A and it's sitting here inside of my hand. The complement of A denoted by A with an apostrophe, which I will just read as A complement is the set of elements that are not in A. And I left so out something kind of important here. Oops, come back here. Give me one second, folks. I need to get rid of that. Go in here for a second. Is the set of elements in the universal set, that's kind of important, that are not in A. Let's go back to highlighting now. 
All right, so the complement of A denoted by A complement is the set of elements in the universal set that are not in A. And yes, I see that I didn't put a space after the word elements. Let's see if I can hop back in there. One second. A little persnickety here, but it's gonna bother me. There we go. And let's put the highlighting back. Set of all elements in the universal set that are not in A. So it's a nutshell, it's everything that's missing from your set. But there has to be a universal set for a frame of reference. Now there is a real, uh, well, I was gonna say really convenient way to define a complement, but I guess convenient is in the eye of the beholder. We can define the complement of A using set builder notation. Remember, set builder notation starts with, a pair, with an open brace and then a variable, usually x, followed by a, ver by a vertical line. And we would read that the set of x is such that, and we have to say what those things have to do. Well, first off, they have to belong to the universal set. So we'll say x is an element of the universal set u. But what else has to be true in order to belong to the complement of a? They have to not be an a. So how would I write that X is not in A? We could say X is not an element of A. This is why it's important for a universal set to exist because if I'm saying that the complement is everything that is not in A, so the every, everything outside of A, I need to know what exists outside of A. Hence, I need to know what the universal set is. Conceptually, the complement is really easy as you're about to see. All right, let's take a look at these examples. For the following universal sets and given sets A, find A complement. Okay, so let's start with example A. Our universal set simply contains the numbers one through 10 and set A contains the numbers two, three, five, and seven. And if you're wondering why I picked those, those are the prime numbers that are in this universe. What would A complement be? Let's put this in red. Okay. What would A complement be? In a nutshell, it's everything in the universe that is missing from A. Again, using the set builder notation, it has to belong to the universe, but it can't belong to A. So why don't we go through our universal elements and pass judgment on them one at a time? Is one an element of A? It is not. Therefore, it belongs to A complement. Is two an element of A? It is. To be an A complement, you cannot belong to A. Since two belongs to A, it does not belong to A complement. And we can go through the rest of them and pass judgment, but I want to show you another way to determine the complement, <clears throat> excuse me, especially if you have the universal set listed out like we do. The complement is literally everything that's missing from A. So one way to see it easily is to go to the universal set and cross out every element that belongs to A. Since A contains two, three, five, and seven, I'm going to cross out two, three, five, and seven. Everything I didn't cross out does not belong to A and therefore belongs to A complement. So the next member of A complement is four, and then six, eight, nine, and 10. Think of it this way. If you have a set inside of a universal set, then every element either belongs to the set or it belongs to its complement. Let's take a look at example B. Example B, our universal set is in, remember that's the natural numbers, and set A is written in set builder notation. It's the set of X's such that X is a natural number and X is greater than seven. All right, can we find A complement without listing the elements of A? We could, but just to show you how you would do it by listing the elements of A, why don't we start listing the elements of A? So how do you get to belong to A? If you're a natural number, so the numbers you count with, one, two, three, four, et cetera, and you are greater than seven. Who's our first number greater than seven? Eight, and then nine, and then 10, and then this goes forever. So now's a good time for some ellipses. That's what A is. To figure out A complement, 
we need to figure out what would be left over if we remove these from the universal set. Just as a reminder, the, un the universal set, the natural numbers in this case, are one, two, or is a set containing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Normally I wouldn't write out this many, but there's a reason why I wanna write out so many. Because I wanna take the same approach I took as an example A, where we located the universal set by crossing out all the elements that belong to A and seeing what elements remained. The set A in this context starts with the number eight and contains everything beyond that. So to find a complement, we can cross out everything starting with eight and beyond that. We are removing A from the universe and seeing what is left. Haven't done the three, three dot triangle today, but in case you missed it in a previous video, it's a symbol for the word therefore. In chapter three, it will become a little bit more formal, formally introduced, I should say. So what is A complement? Well, well, it's all the elements of the universe that I didn't cross out, which is one through seven. I think we can use some ellipses here, but we'll have to end it at seven since the set is finite. So again, the complement of a set is literally everything outside of the set, but still inside the universe. And it's important to say still inside the universe. If my universe wasn't defined, how do I know that A complement doesn't contain all the negatives? or decimals or fractions or stuff like that. So without a universe to refer to, it's technically impossible to calculate a set's complement. All right, let's take a look at example C. The universal set is the set of all citizens of the United States. So descriptive method. And set A is the set of all citizens of Texas. It is important to point out that every, in every element of A is also an element of the universal set. Because if you're a citizen of Texas, since Texas is a state in the United States, then you are a citizen of the United States. But what would A complement be? Let's do this one in blue. What would A complement be? Is it feasible to use the roster method approach where we write out the universal set, write out A, and cross out everything in A that everything in the universal set that belongs to A? No, hardly. So we need to think about this one instead of just doing it, instead of doing it in roster method. Imagine in a room, we have all the citizens of the United States. I know it'd have to be a big room. And then we say, all right, if you are a citizen of Texas, please leave the room. Who would be left in the room? The people that would be left in the room, and I think I'm gonna type this one because there's no symbols I have to draw. So give me one second. We'll even type it in blue. Well, first off, it would be the set of all citizens of the United States. Now there's more to it. I'm just widening this text box and moving it. And again, think about it using the room example. All the citizens of the United States are in a big room and then we say, all right, if you are also a citizen of Texas, please leave the room. All the Texas citizens leave. Who is left? People who are citizens of the United States and at the same time, not citizens of Texas. Now, could we also say something like the set of all citizens of Alaska, Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, and list all other 49 states? We could. Is that efficient? It is not. It is more efficient to say it's a set of all citizens of the United States. Well, we'll say it this way, who are not citizens of Texas. I think that's a little bit better grammatically. So sometimes to describe a complement, you simply say it's a set of everything that's in the universal set, but not in set A. In this context, it's a set of all citizens of the United States who are not citizens of Texas. All right, for the last example, let's take a look at, give me one second, I wanna get rid of this yellow highlighting. There we go. All right, so for the last example, our universal set are the whole numbers, which I could have just used a capital W. And A is the set of natural numbers, which I could have just used a capital A, excuse me, a capital N. Now, if you don't remember what the natural numbers and the whole numbers are, I would try to get that down because I do like to use those two sets quite often. We will go, let's go this color. All right. Do you remember the difference between the whole numbers and the natural numbers? I mentioned it in a previous part of this video. 
the whole numbers start with zero. You know what, I can type this. All right. Our universal set are the whole numbers which start with zero. And our set A are the natural numbers which start with one. So if you were to take the same approach as before, where we go to the universal set and cross out everybody that belongs to A, what's left over will be the complement. One, two, three, and four all belong to A. And therefore, A complement, in fact, everything after zero is crossed out. And so A complement is just the set containing zero. Uh, in upper level math classes, this is called a singleton set because it contains a single element. But um, yeah, it's just the complement of the natural numbers is just the set containing zero if the universe are the whole numbers. All right, so complement's pretty straightforward. Before we wrap up this video, I want to uh, pose one more or two more questions to you. These are a little bit more theoretical. But I was like raising the bar a little bit. I haven't said this yet in, this, in, in any of the videos for this class. But my objective for this class is not to turn you into mathematicians or to get you to want to do more math. I hope you'll want to. My objective in this class is to make you better thinkers, better critical thinkers. The tool that I use to achieve that goal is mathematics. So I want to pose the following questions. Let's start with number one. If the universal set is you, Hmm. Well, that's disappointing. All right. Um, <laughs> I just lost internet connection. And when I got it back, it says it's still recording. So I'm assuming that the video that I started still exists. However, all of the boards that I erased, excuse me, all of the whiteboards that I had written on are gone. But that's okay because I actually was just going with a follow-up. So let's go with that follow-up again. And again, the reason I'm doing this follow-up is because I really want to try to make you better thinkers and not just people following, you know, following monkey see, monkey do math. Uh, but there were two questions I wanted to ask you. The first of which is if the universal set is you, which it always is, but we need to define that first, or at least declare it. What is U complement? And the other question I want to follow up with is, what is the complement of the empty set? So let's think about both of these for a second. And if you notice, I didn't give you a set A. Well, I guess I kind of did in a backward sort of way. In the first one, the set A is everything. And in the second one, the set A is the empty set. So if you want to think about it in that context, but let's just think about this in terms of what complement means. Complement, complement, complement means everything in the universe that is outside of your given set. Well, in part A, our given set is the whole universe. So the complement of the universe would be everything in the universe that is outside of the universe. Well, what can be in the universal set, but at the same time, not in the universal set? It's kind of a trick question. Think of it in terms of the uh, example we did previously with the universal set of all the citizens of the United States. And I wanted to find the complement of that set within itself. If we had a room with all the citizens of the United States in it, and, we, and then we said, all right, if you are a citizen of the United States, leave the room. Who would be left? No one. That room and that set would be empty. The complement of the universal set is the empty set. In other words, the complement of everything is nothing. Well, what do you think the complement of the empty set is. 
Well, think of it again in terms of a room with all the citizens of the United States in it. All the citizens of the United States are in it. And we're going to ask everybody in the empty set to leave. Well, who belongs to the empty set? No one. So if we asked everybody in the empty set to leave, who would we ask to leave the room? No one. So who would be left in the room? Everyone. The complement of the empty set is the universal set. Or the complement of nothing is everything. So those are two supplemental topics that I just wanted to throw out there, but they really get you thinking about what it means to be a universal set in the context, excuse me, a complement in the context of a universal set.